to uh, the Heartland Institute's breakout session here at CPAC 2018 on uh, energy and the environment, uh, focusing more chiefly on President Donald Trump's America First Energy Plan. Uh, first, a little bit about uh, the Heartland Institute. Uh, we are a free market libertarian think tank, conservative think tank, based in uh, Arlington Heights, Illinois, which is the northwest suburbs of the beautiful city of Chicago. And uh, on this topic of energy and the environment, um, it might be better to just kind of quote what others have said about us. The Economist magazine called Heartland the leading think tank promoting skepticism about man-caused climate change. I don't think they meant it as a compliment, but we put it up on our website, so there's that. <laughs> Uh, the Daily Caller, a little more friendly uh, outfit, uh, recently wrote, quote, Heartland has always been public about its ultimate goals, to keep global warming alarmists from winning the public debate, unquote. Very happy about that, also on our website. And then there's Think Progress, which of course is not a friendly website to free market ideas and skepticism of uh, catastrophic human-caused climate change. They recently said, quote, the Heartland Institute offers a model of what the EPA red team might look like their contrarian, non-governmental international panel on climate change, often referred to as a red team, publishes regular volumes of a, of a report called Climate Change Reconsidered. That is me quoting others to kind of explain uh, Heartland's position in the debate, uh, the global debate, over the causes and consequences of climate change. Uh, we're joined by uh, many allies in this uh, discussion, in this fight really, for uh, the scientific method and sensible policy when it comes to environment and climate. One of our allies is sitting here, three of them from uh, CFACT, Craig Rucker, uh, Christina, and uh, Mark Morano are here, and uh, from CFACT, so we're very happy to see them. Of course, uh, the Competitive Enterprise Institute does other great ally, does fantastic work on this subject. Uh, the Heritage Foundation, we have somebody from them on our panel uh, tonight. But all of us working together, it's probably for about the last decade, we've really turned the tables on the alarmism and alarmists. People, you see public, uh, public opinion polls, people don't buy Al Gore's line, despite untold billions of free uh, advertising and pushing of that message. People are smarter than that dumb alarmist message, and it's really fantastic to see. And I like to think that the Heartland Institute has something to do with that uh, result. We've had 12 international conferences on climate change that have featured more than 250 different speakers of scientists, economists, uh, and other experts in the field of, of uh, environment and energy. Heartland publishes Environment and Climate News, a uh, monthly newspaper that is sent to every state and federal elected official in the country, and it's read by most of them, surveys show. Uh, we also have podcasts, the, uh, the Environment and Climate News podcast, along with our energy podcast. That one alone was downloaded more than a quarter million times last year. And all of Heartland's podcasts uh, dealing with liberty issues and public policy issues from a free market perspective were downloaded 2.4 million times last year. Uh, in November, the Heartland Institute hosted the America First Energy Conference in November. Uh, in, in Houston, as I said, in Houston, Texas. That got major media coverage. And we're hosting a second one, uh, the America First Energy Conference 2018, or as we like to call it, AFEC 2018. That's gonna be on August 7th in New Orleans. Um, there are sign-up sheets to register your attendance here at this, uh, at this uh, side panel, at this breakout session. Uh, we're gonna pick one of those people that get a uh, free admission and a free hotel stay in New Orleans. Uh, so uh, please fill that out and for your chance to win that. Uh, but Heartland has been described as, as, I think, fairly leading the charge among others to support President Trump and his America First Energy Plan. And we want all of you to join us as well. Just think about what President Trump has accomplished already. And it's been barely a year where he's been in office uh, ANWR is opened up for oil exploration. I think that was a policy 40 years in the making. Uh, it just never was going to happen, people thought. I have family in, in Alaska. They're very happy about this. Of course, the Keystone XL and the Dakota Access Pipelines checked off. That was very fast. And the, uh, the campers packed up. They didn't clean up, but they packed up and they left. <laughs> and now we're getting energy moving uh, from the upper Midwest down to where we need it. Uh, offshore oil exploration, of course, that was a recent thing. Just about everywhere you can see off the coast, anywhere in the United States, is now open to oil exploration. That's fantastic. 
Uh, let's see, Fr oh, the fracking revolution, of course. We have the fracking guy, that's his Twitter handle, Isaac Gore from the Artland Institute. Uh, he's extremely happy about that, has written about that a lot. So more uh, public land is going to be uh, fracked responsibly. And that is, fan that is really great news. Let's see, uh, oh yeah, we ended the war on coal. That's what Donald Trump did. And uh, that's, this isn't even the whole list. These are just the things I could think of in about 15 seconds before coming down here today. And it is amazing. And none of this, not a single bit of this agenda, not one would have a sniff of it if Hillary Clinton was elected president. All of this is almost unilaterally done because the American people were wise enough, especially in places like Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Michigan, were wise enough to elect Donald Trump president of the United States. It really is a new day for energy policy in the United States. And of course, how can we, not, how can we forget one of the first high profile things Donald Trump did was withdraw the United States from the uh, Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, of course, the media said this was gonna be the end of the world. The United States is no longer leading the world on these issues. Uh, we're gonna be hated. Uh, we're not going to meet our goals. This is a terrible, terrible thing. But as, of course, as it turns out, just a, uh, I think yesterday or two days ago, there's a story showing that the, the EU as a whole, all of them still in Paris, none of them have reached their goals for reducing CO2 emissions into the atmosphere. We have. We've actually reduced our CO2 emissions in the United States uh, compared to Europe and Australia and Japan and all those other uh, signatories. Why? Because partly because of the fracking revolution, because we're using more natural gas. And mostly because we're not letting others set our agenda here in the United States. We're letting Americans set our agenda in the United States. We'll get clean, and we'll get fast, and we'll get rich on our terms, not the world's terms. Donald Trump had the wisdom to know that and to get us out of Paris. So he's leading on this issue, uh, not, following, not falling behind. And then, so the program today is going to feature a good bit of energy, but also some science, some climate science policy, uh, especially when it comes to the effect of carbon dioxide on global temperatures. Uh, and this is why it matters to have this kind of conference here, because you get so much, or this kind of breakout session here at, at, at CPAC, because there's so much disinformation out there, so much propaganda out there. Um, like I said earlier, it is really a miracle that the American people are not buying this. But I think a lot of that is just instinct. You're going to walk out of this room today knowing why you're skeptical that humans are causing a climate crisis. You see with your own eyes that we're not causing a climate crisis. You're going to walk out of here with a lot of great information to explain why. And it's important because, as James Dellingpole, a lot of uh, Breitbart fans in here, I'm sure, as, Bright De uh, as James Dellingpole's written, in fact, it was the title of one of his books a while back, um, Watermelons. Green is the new red. They're green on the outside but they are red on the inside. And that's why they get so mad when you question climate dogma. It's always, it, you, know, you have a revelation at some point. Why are you so mad at me? Because I disagree with you on policy and I believe scientists who are not so alarmist as you. Why are you attacking anyone who says that so heavily? And it's because they don't actually care that you're questioning the science or even questioning the policy. You're questioning their dogma, you're questioning you're standing in the way of what they really want, which is a command and control economy. Because if you can convince the people that the only way we could save the planet is to force you to do what I say, what does that sound like? It sounds like communism, it sounds like socialism, it sounds like authoritarianism. And if you undercut the scientific justification for taking over basically everything you do in your life to save the planet, they have nothing left. And that is why they get so upset about this issue. Uh, and you should remember that as you, as you are brave enough to oppose them because uh, it just destroys their entire agenda. When you destroy the lies they've said about science, the lies they've said about the scientists that we work with, and the lies they say about the effect of CO2 on our planet, uh, just takes everything else away from them. Uh, so with that, thank you for your attention. And uh, we have three panelists uh, today. I'm going to introduce each one of them in turn as they come up. And our first speaker is named David Legates. He's a PhD, he's a professor of climatology in the Department of Geography at the University of Delaware, and an adjunct professor at the University's Physical Ocean Science and Engineering Program, and in the Department of Applied Economics. At the 10th annual, I'm sorry, at the 10th International Conference on Climate Change held by the Heartland Institute in 2015, he was presented with the Courage in Defense of Science Award. Legates has also earned certified consulting meteorologist status from the American Meteorological Society and in 1999 was awarded the Boeing Autometric Award for submitting the best paper in image analysis and interpretation. 
He has published more than 125 articles in peer-reviewed peer journals, conference proceedings, and monograph series, and has made more, more than 300 professional presentations, including this one here for us today. Uh, please welcome to the stage David LeGates. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today, and I'm glad that you took the time to listen to what I and everyone else had to say. Uh, of course, if you know the party line, the argument is generally that uh, carbon dioxide is bad. Um, as Jim said, um, we want you to talk about climate change. Uh, I want to cover the entire waterfront of everything going on. And by the way, you got 15 minutes to do it. Uh, <laughs> I said I don't think I was likely to happen. So I said I would focus on primarily one question. And that question is going to be, is carbon dioxide a pollutant or is it a benefit? And of course, if you understand the way the dogma reads, that carbon dioxide is clearly a pollutant produced by, as a byproduct of fossil fuel use. It is dangerous. It's leading to all sorts of climate change. And worse yet, it's killing the planet. So the question we want to say is, is that true? Let's, let's look at the facts. Uh, I could make a number of statements, and generally I'd be pilloried in the press for it. So what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to pass the buck and let somebody else make the statement for me. This is Dr. Sylvan Whitwer. He happens to be an agronomist at Michigan State University. He's written a number of books on feeding the planet. And his quote is, it should be considered good fortune that we are living in a world of gradually increasing levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide, and that rising levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide is really a universally free premium. As we've seen, carbon dioxide has been increasing. It's increased uh, uh, quite a bit over the last uh, three, excuse me, 30, 40 years, um, and most of this is due to human activities. The question is, is it a bad thing? Well, let me cite someone who's not, you're not likely to find here. She's the winner of the Rachel Carson Environmental Ethics Award. I'll let you think about that for a moment. Um, and her quote is, organisms don't think of CO2 as a poison. They think of it as a building block, really. So if we were, let's say, work, working in a greenhouse, would we want to see more carbon dioxide in our greenhouse? And the answer is yes, we would. We would probably buy one of these pieces of equipment that enrich carbon dioxide so that we would see two, three, four times the natural uh, concentration, which of course causes plants to go faster and improve plant quality. How do we know this? We've seen work from Dr. Sherwood it so well back uh, a number of years ago. You take a fir seedling and you grow it essentially at 350 parts per million, and you can see under ambient uh, carbon dioxide concentrations after a given time period it has reached to about his belt buckle. If you took a seedling at the same time and subjected it to 500 parts per million, it would have grown better. It would have grown up to about the middle of his chest. Another seedling starts at the same time in higher carbon concentrations, grows larger, grows higher, and by the time we get to 800 parts per million, the same time period, the same comparative seedling is about as tall as he was. But what about crops? Here you can see peas and grow them in reduced carbon dioxide concentrations of 97 or 127 parts per million. Enhanced carbon dioxide, they grow better and more carbon dioxide gets you faster growth of peas. This holds for a number of different types of vegetation and crops, and I won't go through all of them, but the take home message is that yes, indeed, she was correct. Carbon dioxide is the building block of plants. So the idea is the more carbon dioxide, the better plants grow, except for the second U.S. National Assessment on climate change comes this figure. And the figure talks about corn and soybean temperature response. And I want to focus on corn because, as I said, I only have like 15 minutes. And you'll notice from the curve two things are happening. One is the optimum growing temperature of corn is about 81 Fahrenheit. And it drops off dramatically on either side of that temperature. Moreover, they conclude corn will fail to reproduce at temperatures above 95 Fahrenheit. So clearly, you would never find corn growing in places like Phoenix, Arizona. So last time I showed this slide, there was a gentleman sitting down front from Phoenix, Arizona, he raised his hand and said, but sir, we grow corn in Phoenix, Arizona. And I said, but sir, no you don't, because the second national assessment says you can't. <laughs> 
So we had to figure out a way to decide this dispute. And I thought the best place to go to was somebody who knows more about growing corn than anyone on the planet, and that would be Iowa farmers. So I went to Iowa State University Department of Agronomy, and here's what they said. First of all, common corn varieties will grow fastest at 93 Fahrenheit. Wait a minute, I thought it was 81 Fahrenheit. Now we're 20, 12 degrees warmer is the optimum temperature, and if you'll notice, it's very resilient to temperature variability. So essentially, we would expect to find corn growing in Phoenix, in Iowa, in Delaware, uh, gee, over most of the United States, which, of course, we do. But there's two other things that most people don't know about increasing carbon dioxide that leave two added benefits that are going to make things much better for plants. The first is that more CO2 means the plants will use less water. In a day and age where water is a premium, where we, we run short of water, we have potential droughts, it's nice to know that if we have more carbon dioxide, the plants are going to become more water efficient. You'll notice here the blue lines are associated with conditions at 360 parts per million, and the orange lines are associated with conditions that are twice that, elevated carbon dioxide. And regardless of whether you look at the well-watered condition, the solid curves, solid lines, or the water stress conditions, the open boxes, you see that regardless, under higher carbon dioxide concentrations, the amount of water used is less. We can see this from another research that came out last year. Rising carbon dioxide is making the world's plants more water-wise. And their take-home message is, that land plants are absorbing 17% more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere now than they did 30 years ago. The vegetation is hardly using any extra water to do it, suggesting that global change is causing the world's plants to grow in a more water efficient way. So plants will become more water efficient, but there's a second added benefit. And that second benefit is that higher carbon dioxide concentrations dramatically raise the optimum growth temperature. You can see we saw before under carbon, higher carbon dioxide concentrations that we had more growth regardless of temperature. But the optimum growth temperature shifts to a warmer temperature under higher carbon dioxide. So in fact, if the temperatures do rise, that's okay because the plants will be more attuned to using that higher temperature and using that energy. Here's a result of 350 referee papers and the take home message is the net effect is that CO2 uses less water and ultimately produces more food. Therefore, we can conclude that this is going to lead to a greener planet. But how can it be a greener planet? If you've read Al Gore's latest book, of course, the earth is in a fever and that fever is causing plants to die. So but it's not. Here you can see change in leaf area index from 1982 2015, you can see places where leaf area has decreased, but many places where leaf area has increased, and in particular, more green and deeper values of green imply that we're having a greener planet. In addition, we can look at long-lived trees, such as bristlecone pines, that last for a thousand years, some cases longer. They've been around for a thousand years, but right now they're in their growth heyday. Why? Because of the increase in carbon dioxide. You can see they're growing better now than they ever have over a thousand years. I want to give you another quote from somebody you're not likely to find here. <laughs> it says, the path to global peace is to increase agricultural productivity. It says, thriving agriculture, to which I would also add inexpensive energy, is the engines that fuel broader economic growth and development. Here we can see observed and projected benefit of rising atmospheric CO2. And you can see generally that curve is on the rise. And over the next, from 2012 to 2050, you can see that we would expect to get almost $10 trillion out of agriculture. Let me go back to Sylvan Whitmore. He says the rising level of atmospheric CO2 could be the one global natural resource that is progressively increasing food production and total biological output. The argument I always hear is that but climate change is going to differentially impact the poorest people. They're going to be the ones hurt by climate change. But what he says, the effects know no boundaries. Both developing and developed countries are and will be sharing equally. 
So the argument is, if you really care for the poor of the world in Africa, in India, and other places around the planet, what we really want is a thriving agriculture that's aided by carbon dioxide, and we want inexpensive energy, which the other gentleman will talk about in a moment. But yes, I know. The planet is largely water. Two-thirds to three-quarters of the planet is water, and the planet, the oceans are dying. So, so we, we saw at uh, Jane Lubchenco's talk uh, in Congress, uh, December of 2009. She talked about osteoporosis of the sea. <laughs> the idea that essentially what's happening is carbon dioxide is absorbed by the ocean. In turn, that produces carbonic acid. More acid generally leads to de decreasing values. And then she saw the hard parts of many familiar animals such as oysters, clams, cr corals, lobsters, crabs, being that they're made of calcium carbonate, are going to dissolve. And she showed slides like this, where you can see a, a crustacean on J0 doing really well, and 45 days later, it's almost dead. So let's see what happens. Let's take a, um, I've spent some time in Louisiana, so let's take a little bit Louisiana crawfish. And we'll grow it under normal CO2. And after a time, it's this big. And we'll take one of its siblings. And we'll grow it under seven times CO2. <laughs> it gets bigger. Sorry. It gets bigger. <laughs> and moreover, what you don't see is that the, the shell has deteriorated. It just simply has grown quite a bit. Let's bring it a little closer to home. Closer to here, Mark. <laughs> Blue crabs. Normal CO2, 400 parts per million, the crab does fine. Unfortunately, it's a little small. We're going to have to throw it back. Uh, <laughs> but under seven times CO2, now that one's a keeper. It's growing well, it's growing bigger. Those are the kinds of crabs we want to find. <laughs> so what's going on? Well, if Dr. Lubchenko had looked at Science Journal, she would have found just one year earlier, there was a publication that came out. And the authors concluded as follows. Increased atmospheric carbon dioxide also enhances marine life. Well, how can that be? In a sense, the argument is that what a lot of people have been doing is cutting the corner. That is, instead of using carbon dioxide and bubbling it through to produce carbonic acid, instead, they just lowered the pH by dumping in hydrochloric acid. Now, you don't have to be a chemistry major to know that the chemistry of hydrochloric acid is different than the chemistry of carbonic acid. So yes, under hydrochloric acid, plant, uh, animal life, plant in the oceans will be affected. But nobody's putting hydrochloric acid in. We're putting carbonic acid. And that leads to increased life and to increased sizes of blue crabs, crayfish, and all the fun stuff we like to eat. She went on, or they went on to write, Increasing carbon dioxide, in fact, enhances growth of phytoplankton. Remember the phytoplankton at the bottom of the food chain. And they found that phytoplankton under increased carbon dioxide not only will become more prevalent, they'll become bigger. So there's more to eat, which is, explains a lot why these carbon dioxide, that why car increased carbon dioxide makes crayfish, blue crabs, and everything bigger is because they have a lot more food available in the food chain. The last thing I want to talk about today, since we're talking about the oceans, is essentially the uh, Great Barrier Reef. And if you've read the hype, the Great Barrier Reef is essentially disappearing. It's nearly dead, if not already gone. Um, but there's one person who has spoken out about this. This is Dr. Peter Ridd of James Cook University. He's been working in the Great Barrier Reef for 30 years. And he said, I don't see any of this. In fact, I think people are making it up because it is not true. His university, James Cook University, essentially said, um, you're not being collegial by criticizing others. Um, if you continue speaking out this way, we will have to dismiss you from the university. Um, and by the way, don't tell anybody what we are going to do because that's none of their business. Uh, but he decided it is their business, and he's spoken out about it. Now, I'm very much familiar with firsthand with what happens when a university goes after its own faculty. But I can also say that we've been down this road before. And if you're not familiar with somebody called Trophim Lysenko and the idea of Lysenkoism, please look him up because 
what has what happened in the Soviet Union back in the 1930s was anybody studying genetics had their careers ended or worse yet had their lives ended and the idea was natural selection was preferable in science and you may not study genetics we're headed down the same road even though the left wants to pretend that the Trump administration is doing this it's not the people that are being squelched the people that are being silenced and the people doing the silence are all, I should say, the people doing the silencing are all those people that you would expect. The left as it was back in the 1930s. We've got to pay close attention to what's happening because this undermines the very in integral of what science is all about. And it's good that Peter, people like Peter Red are speaking out, even though what's happening to him is, is off the charts as to what is expected. I'm afraid this is where we're headed down the road in that you may get to the point where it's politically correct to view one part of science, science that is carbon dioxide is evil, but whatever I've just said here is something that will be silenced at some point in the future. At that point, I'll say thank you very much, and I'll turn it back to you. That was fantastic, you know. You, you had me a blue crab, David, I must say. <laughs> I think we have a new PR uh, front to, to take out, uh, for sure. Uh, this just, just goes to say, I, I've listened to, I don't know, 100 different presentations from, and, and David has given many at, at Heartland's uh, climate conferences, and I just learned something, several things new today. And so you can actually check out a lot of these presentations yourself. Uh, if you go to climateconferences.heartland.org, you can see every one of the 200 and uh, 79 videos I think we have there, or probably up to 300 by now. Or you can look us up on YouTube, uh, heart, you know, youtube.com slash heartlandtube, and we have all of our, our, our presentations there as well, broken down by each 12 of them, so I hope that you will uh, remember that and check them out. Our next speaker is uh, Nick Loris. He's an economist. He focuses on energy, environmental, and regulatory issues as the Herbert and Joyce Morgan Fellow at the Heritage Foundation, a research fellow in Heritage's Rowe Institute for Economic Policy Studies. Loris studies and writes about energy supplies, energy prices, and other economic effects of environmental policies and regulations, including climate change legislation, energy efficiency mandates, and energy subsidies. He also covers coal, oil, natural gas, uh, nuclear and renewable energy policy, and articulates the benefits of free market environmentalism. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Nick Loris. There we go. No problem. Thank you. Well, David's presentation reminds me uh, of a story my colleague tells, and David might be familiar with this study. I believe it came out of Duke University where they did the same thing. They pumped a whole bunch of CO2 uh, into a bunch of different plants, saw crazy amounts of growth, crazy amounts of benefits. The headline, the top takeaway from their study was that increased CO2 results in more poison ivy. Uh, so they ignored all of the good stuff, uh, focused on the one bad thing that came out of their study, uh, and that kind of goes to show you where some of the academic bias can lie in some of these studies. Uh, but we're going to sh shift gears a little bit. I'm going to talk about energy uh, and prosperity uh, because energy, uh, most of which comes from conventional sources of CO2 emitting uh, energy, natural resources like coal, oil, and natural gas, um, provide such uh, an important and critical component to uh, our everyday life. It's a key building block uh, to how we heat our homes, how we cool our homes, how we, how we light buildings. Uh, Almost everything we make and everything we do uh, comes from energy. Um, but before we get into that, I want to take it back to show where we've come from. Uh, and someone who does this, I think, better than uh, anybody uh, is Matt Ridley in his book, The Rational Optimist. And if you've read that, uh, this is kind of a, a cryptid version of what he talks about, where he paints this picture of this family in, in 1800 where everything seems pretty serene. Uh, you know, you've got a family reading by the fire. Uh, there's some stew uh, on top of the fire. Uh, there's no uh, industrial noise or activity. There's no cars whizzing by your house or anything like that. And it all sounds pretty serene until he paints the picture of how bad things really are for a family, a well-off family, 
in Western Europe in 1800. Uh, it's families that are living under roofs that are thatched and, and infested with vermin. Uh, you have uh, a father's a week's worth or a month's worth of wages. Uh, the only thing he can buy with that is a new jacket, which will be infested with lice in, in a couple weeks. Uh, he has a bronchitic cough um, that he can't do anything about uh, and will likely die when he's 53. The wife has a toothache, the baby has problems, and, and they lost two. Uh, these are the challenges uh, that people faced in the year 1800, uh, and it's really energy in the Industrial Revolution uh, that, that changed all that. If you could look at what world GDP has done since then uh, has largely been a result of mechanization powered largely by fossil fuels. Uh, if you look at some of where energy increased around that time, largely from coal, it fundamentally changed uh, how we did work. Um, and, and Ridley's statistics on this are phenomenal. He said by 1870, the burning of coal generated as much as 850 million workers and steam engines equated to 6 million horses. So these are phenomenal, phenomenal gains in a relatively short amount of time. Uh, and it didn't just change uh, how we powered our homes, but it also obviously led to the vehicle. It led to uh, fertilization uh, and the increased use of pesticides so we could uh, grow more food safely. Uh, refrigeration allowed us uh, to keep food longer. It was the introduction of simple things like soaps and laundry detergents uh, so we didn't have to go wash our clothes uh, in the nearby river. We actually had opportunities to uh, recycle our clothes. Uh, and so these gains correlated very strongly uh, with the increased use of fossil fuels, which have provided 80% of our fuel mix uh, since at least 1900, dating back even a, a little further back than that. Um, and they're likely to do so going forward. I think there, there's folks who think that these fuels uh, are antiquated and, and sources of energy of the past. Uh, if you look at studies from the EIA, uh, the Energy uh, Information Administration, uh, or if you look at any of the, the World Energy Industries, BP's en Energy Outlook, uh, it's going to stay like this for the foreseeable future. It may dip down to 75% over the next 25 to 30 years, uh, but it's likely not going to change. Uh, and we can't forget about the, ec the environmental benefits that come with this economic growth. Uh, it, it's phenomenal how we see when it results from uh, the simple components of economic freedom, uh, private property rights. You know, the, the economists say that nobody washes a rental car uh, because you don't own it, you don't take care of it. When you have private property rights uh, that are um, protected uh, with a sound rule of law, uh, you have huge environmental protections as well. And so it's no surprise that there's a, a very strong correlation between economic freedom and environmental protection. Uh, and we use less energy. Uh, it, it, there's a very inherent business uh, and household incentive to conserve energy when it costs money, when it's an input to businesses with everything they make. And you see it with little examples like minuscule uh, amounts of plastic reduction on a water bottle. Uh, these small amounts of efficiency improvements yield big results in reduced energy consumption per dollar of GDP. So we're using energy smarter. Uh, and I think where there's a lot of opportunity to even improve upon that much further uh, if we break down some of the regulatory <coughs> barriers facing electricity markets. I mean, if you think about it now, you get a bill every month, you pay it, and you move on. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be like that, and I think if you have the Uberization or the Airbnbization of electricity markets, where you know where your electricity is coming from, um, when there's peak demands, you can set your dishwasher to, to go off at 10 p.m. instead of 5.30 p.m., and you give consumers more choice and you introduce more competition into electricity markets, uh, which is a, a whole new topic of conversation that we don't have to get into today. Uh, it will not only yield more consumer choice and, and more energy savings, uh, but it will reduce that energy consumption per dollar of GDP even further. So looking at the contrast between the Obama administration's policies uh, and the Trump administration's, uh, it, it's no surprise that uh, the Obama administration had this keep it in the ground mentality that was uh, hostile to conventional sources of energy. Um, it was grounded in this notion that we need to do something about climate change, 
Uh, it was also grounded in a very strong environmental activist base uh, that he catered to, uh, and I d disregarded his own uh, administration officials in a lot of senses. Keystone XL is the perfect example where uh, you had former Interior Secretary saying Keystone was a good idea. You had former Department of Energy Secretary Stephen Chu saying Keystone XL was a good idea, uh, and yet uh, he rejected the pipeline on multiple occasions. Uh, and then, obviously, the other big part of this was using other people's money to stimulate a green economy um, and, and really taking uh, money from taxpayers or from our, our children's future uh, to give us cylindras, to give us Fisker automotives, or to, to pad the wallets uh, of very well-off companies who don't need help from the taxpayer. Uh, and I'd like to spend a few minutes on this because I think if there's uh, a Venn diagram of Trump and Obama, uh, there is a little bit of intersection here uh, where we're picking winners and losers in energy markets. And some of that is because the, the subsidization of certain policies are so entrenched. I mean, they date back decades. Uh, so they're very difficult to get rid of. I mean, once these policies are put in place, like the ethanol mandate, even though it's practically recognized by uh, environmentalists, by economists, by uh, many in the agricultural community uh, as a bad policy uh, that picks a, a set of winners and disperses the costs amongst the rest of us, uh, it remains in place. And even when Scott Pruitt uh, looked to uh, reduce it modestly, um, you know, it was, it was as if he was proposing to repeal the whole thing, um, which wasn't even close. Uh, the reason I bring this up is because this is what truly prevents innovation from occurring uh, in the energy sector. Uh, and you have uh, not only politicians pretending they're sharks on Shark Tank and, and people coming to politicians with a good idea or a bad idea saying, oh, we only need a little bit of seed money from the taxpayer to get this going. Uh, it really reduces the incentive to innovate and lower costs and compete in a free market uh, without help from the taxpayer. And then more policies become entrenched because they're saying, oh, he gets a subsidy, why don't I get a subsidy? Uh, and then they'll offer a five-year tax credit to that company, and when five years is up, they'll say, oh, we need three more years, we need five more years. And it's this vicious cycle of lobbyists and politicians determining who produces what, uh, that we need to get rid of energy sources uh, for all subsidies, or for all sources of energy, um, including fossil fuels, including nuclear, um, but also uh, for renewables as well. The other big aspect of this is uh, a lot of it is just corporate welfare. Uh, if you look at the loan guarantee program, for instance, uh, where we had Solyndra and we had Fisker and several other DOE-funded failures, um, yes, that was a big problem. Um, and, and I think Solyndra is the poster child for why the federal government shouldn't be investing in renewable projects. Uh, but a lot of these companies also have, or subsidiaries, or have backing from Google and Goldman Sachs and other very well-off companies that, as I mentioned earlier, don't need help from the federal taxpayer. Uh, and not only does this pick winners and losers, but it also distorts the way that private investors uh, make their decisions. If you look at something like Solyndra, private investors sunk a billion dollars into Solyndra, uh, and it was only after it was the DOE that announced that they qualified for the loan guarantee program where a whole bunch of investors said, okay, that looks good, it's got the, the government's backing, uh, let's sink our money into it as well. That's a billion dollars that couldn't be invested elsewhere into the economy. So the market distortions create very big problems uh, in terms of how people invest. Now, let's look a little bit at the contrast because there's a lot of distortions. Uh, and, and Jim mentioned everything that the Trump administration has done uh, to uh, reduce what the Obama administration had either done or had planned and stop the bleeding in a lot of senses. And it's pretty clear uh, the trajectory of where the economy would grow, uh, where uh, economic prosperity would go based on these two environmental and energy strategies. Uh, if you look at any type of cost of a cap and trade plan to reduce, to reduce CO2 emissions or the Clean Power Plan, Paris Climate Agreement, all of these climate change regulations, a carbon tax, whatever the case may be, uh, they all find net economic losses. Uh, even dating back to the cap and trade years, which date back more than a decade now, 
there was analyses from the CBO, uh, the Congressional Budget Office. There was analysis uh, from the Environmental Protection Agency, from the Brookings Institute, which is a, a left-leaning institution. They all found costs to cap and trade because when you restrict energy consumption and availability, you are going to raise the costs again for everything we make and everything we do. It's not just our electricity bills. It's not just when we fill up our gas tanks. Uh, it's reflected uh, in everything. And this acts as an economic vice that really shrinks the production side of the economy and uh, the consumption side of the economy. So you get huge economic losses. Conversely, uh, the opposite is quite true. Everything the Trump administration is proposing to do to open up access uh, will yield very significant economic benefits. Uh, and the things that the administration has done, whether it's reverse leasing, uh, coal leasing on federal lands, open offshore drilling, uh, reduce uh, the climate change regulations in terms of the Clean Power Plan and the new source performance standards for CO2, uh, more uh, transportation and infrastructure for energy, uh, these things result uh, in tremendous economic gains. Uh, and, and you can see them here, uh, average employment gain of 700,000, an increase in $40,000 for a family of four uh, by the year 2035, uh, reducing electricity expenditures, which allows uh, households to spend more money on other things. Uh, and David mentioned impacts on the poor. I mean, these are policies that do have real impacts on the poor. I mean when you're constricting the use of energy, it disproportionately impacts low-income households who spend a higher percentage of their budget on energy. Uh, so if they're making difficult choices between food, paying the bills to keep their lights on, uh, or health care, uh, these bit of savings uh, help tremendously. What can Congress and the administration do? Again, I think what the, what the Trump administration has done uh, has been uh, phenomenal in terms of this notion of opening access and reducing the regulatory barriers uh, to energy production. Uh, opening access to exploration of federal waters and lands, which is going through a five-year planning process. Ultimately, I think Congress should scrap this five-year planning process. It's not really grounded in market realities. Uh, and one thing that the opponents always say is that, well, energy prices are too low, uh, that we shouldn't be drilling right now, or, or no, there's no commercial interest. Uh, that's not for politicians and bureaucrats to determine. That's for the market to determine. Uh, and for them, it's never a good time to explore for oil and natural gas, uh, or coal for that matter. If prices are too low, uh, they'll say they shouldn't do it. If prices are too high and you want to open it up then, they'll say it takes too long to get that energy from the ground to the market. So there's no good time. They're going to be hostile to access to this energy development no matter when it is and no matter what prices look like. But again, that's not for members of Congress or administrations to determine. But what Congress needs to do is step up and codify some of the administration's policies. I mean, that's a very, very big part of this. So later down the road, we don't see a reversal of all of the good things the administration currently uh, is doing. And then there's things like repeal NEPA um, with an infrastructure debate coming up and uh, a trillion and a half dollars on the table for spending. Uh, the National Environmental Policy Act is one thing that could significantly inhibit uh, the private sector to uh, actually create shovel-ready jobs and build the infrastructure we need. Uh, repealing the renewable fuel standard, um, that, that again is a very big lift, um, but that's something that if we want competition in fuel markets, um, this looks like it's on the way to transition to a low carbon fuel standard, um, which is the exact wrong direction that we want to go. Um, because the policy mandates that we blend 36 billion gallons of ethanol by the year 2022. After 2022, it's up to the EPA to set the standards. Uh, that's very problematic. Uh, remove impediments to exports. Uh, that is something that the administration has done on a small scale. Uh, right now, if we want to export to a country with a non-free trade agreement, uh, it has to go through an additional process at the Department of Energy. Uh, that whole process needs to be scrapped. Uh, again, it shouldn't be the federal government determining whether this export idea or this export is in America's natural interest. And, and these national interest determinations are what led to the Obama administration rejecting the Keystone XL pipeline. Uh, these should be market decisions. We export every other good to non-free trade agreement countries all the time. Natural gas should be treated 
just like those goods. Uh, it should be market-based. Uh, so long as it's not inhibiting any threats to national security, uh, it, it should be a decision by the producer and the consumer. Uh, rollback of climate change regulations, um, endangerment finding, which we can talk about, but that's a, a whole other bag of words. And the other aspect I'd like to just briefly talk about is nuclear energy policy, because that's something that people don't talk as much about in an era of cheap natural gas. Uh, and, and there's been proposals to bail out some existing nuclear plants. Uh, that's not where the solution lies for the future of nuclear power. We could bail out a few plants, we could provide loan guarantees to a few plants, and yeah, that'll maybe get two or three built, um, potentially at very significant risk to the taxpayer, uh, but we really need to fundamentally reform how the Nuclear Regulatory Commission conducts the license and permitting process uh, for new reactors. Uh, right now it's concentrated to these large light water reactors, which we have, I believe, 99 up and running right now. And it, it gives these companies uh, a pretty straightforward pathway into the license and permitting process. But there's a lot of very cool, innovative, small, small modular reactor technologies that are knocking at the NRC's doorstep and they're saying, uh, we're having a hard enough time licensing these large light water reactors, come back to us you know, in four to eight years, uh, if not longer. Uh, and in that respect, all of the VC funding goes out the window uh, when you're talking about that type of time horizon. So if we can get uh, the front end of nuclear regulatory reform right, and if we can fix the spent fuel problem, which I think, again, is problematic, but only problematic because the government agreed to take title of this waste, uh, even though it's a commercial activity, uh, which has led to the boondoggle that it is today. Um, those are something that I think, even in an era of cheap natural gas, we can see more competition and innovation in the nu nuclear sector uh, and have an opportunity to see if this nuclear renaissance could really kick off. Um, with that, I think I'm over my time, so That's I will fun. stop there. <laughs> and uh, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thanks for that, Nick. Um, I would say this is our final speaker, but it's not our final speaker because um, we're going to have uh, Heartland and President and CEO Tim Hulskamp also speak at this uh, at this breakout session. But our the last of our trio right immediately here with PowerPoint presentations is uh, Isaac Gore. Uh, Isaac is a research fellow for energy and environmental policy at the Heartland Institute. Uh, he's a speaker, a researcher. A writer specializing in hydraulic fracturing, frac sand mining, agricultural and environmental policy issues, as well as uh, the future, or the past, the present, and the future of coal in the United States, as a matter of fact. Uh, Heartless Institute has put out four um, fantastic white papers on uh, coal production and uh, its role in the, in the grid. <coughs> Uh, the lead author of four of those papers, uh, so I advise you to go to heartland.org where you can find copies of yourself, for yourself I should say. He graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire with studies in political science and geology, which is why he loves writing about coal. He, uh, he won awards for his undergraduate geology research before taking a position as an aide in the Wisconsin State Senate, where he served as a lead office writer and as a policy advisor at frac sand mining uh, and agricultural issues. Um, please welcome for his presentation, Heartland's Isaac Orr. All right, way to bury my joke, Jim. All right, so here we go. Uh, we're gonna be talking about coal and its future and its past a little bit. So this is the uh, America First Energy Plan, which, you know, if you saw the State of the Union, you saw the president go beautiful, clean coal. And if you looked at Twitter after that, it was really great because the Sierra Club's head exploded. Uh, they were not pleased that he described coal in that way, but I think it's important to look at well, is it clean, is it coal, or is it beautiful? I mean, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, but um, just looking at the overview, I think it's important for all of us to understand where does our energy come from? Where does, you know, the, what's powering the lights in this room right now? So many people have no idea. I grew up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin, and you'd be amazed how many people think milk comes from the store. And I think that that's kind of where we've gotten with the energy in our, in our gas tanks and all of that. It's just always been there, so we take it for granted. Um, is coal really beautiful and clean? How much coal is there and why should we use coal? 
So I like to think of it this way. Imagine your phone battery. Don't pull out your phone because I won't get you back for this presentation. Uh, but just think about it in terms of how much of our energy do you think comes from wind and solar? How much of it do you think comes from nuclear? How much do you think comes from coal, oil, or natural gas? And I like to phrase it this way because when people's battery gets below like 50%, they start to think, well, where's that charger at? Um, so this is, this is why I like to talk about it. And whenever I ask people, how much energy do you think we get from wind and solar? They say, you know, not much, probably 20, 30%. <laughs> and then uh, I show them this, 0.6% of the total energy that we use in our everyday lives comes from solar. And this includes, you know, large hospitals. The large hospitals in the United States use more energy than the entire country of Ecuador. So when you think about the energy use that we use in our country, it's massive. And we need that energy on demand. Uh, so wind, 2.2%. Uh, so despite all the wind turbines, we don't really get that much energy from wind. Uh, we get 1.9% of our energy from wood, which as you saw in Nick's presentation, uh, you need to send me that graphic because it was so cool. Um, wood used to be our predominant energy source and now it's down to 1.9%. But despite that, it still produces about as much as wind and solar. Um, hydroelectric is 2.4%. Nuclear is 9%. Coal is 15%, natural gas is 29%, and oil is 37%. And obviously oil is mostly used for transportation, natural gas is used for heating, but when you look at electricity generation by source, you'll see that coal has been the dominant source of electricity generation fuel you know, since pretty much forever. Uh, hydroelectric was very important for a long time when the, the technology was just getting started, but uh, coal's been declining since 2008, and a lot of that is due to regulations imposed by the Obama administration. So um, the, the fracking revolutions obviously made natural gas more competitive with coal. Um, but yeah, nuclear is important, and renewables are still just a small share despite all the subsidies that they get from the federal government. So I want to talk about the environmental impacts of coal, because I think it would be silly to ignore this whenever somebody wants to paint coal in a negative light, they generally show pictures of cities not in the United States. It's <laughs> Beijing, it's India, and there is a, there's a real problem there with air pollution, and coal is partially the reason for that. But it's not so much the power plants there, it's the people are using it as a primary heating fuel. They're using it instead of burning wood in their houses for heating or staying warm during the winter. Uh, and that causes a lot of pollution because there's no sophisticated uh, flue gas desulfurization, basically scrubbers, um, that takes care of that. So uh, in the United States, we realized that, yeah, we had a problem with our air quality, so we passed the, green, uh, the Clean Air Act, and that established pollution limits on six criteria pollutants. I won't, I won't bore you with this too much, but it's sulfur oxides, nitrous oxides, lead, carbon monoxide, ozone, and particulate matter. And before we take a look at, well, did it work, maybe the solution to the Clean Air Act was, well, we just have burned less coal since then. And that's really not true. So the Clean Air Act was in the late 70s, early 80s. And you see that we've basically burned more coal since 1980 than we did in the years preceding it. Uh, on the other hand, we have clean, beautiful air. And that's because <laughs> we have implemented policies that restrict the amount of sulfur dioxide that we can emit, the nitrous oxide. So you'll see that almost every single one of these pollutants has had a dramatic reduction in their, their persistence in the air, and especially lead. So lead is this uh, red line up there. Look over on the, the other side, because this is the, the scale for all the other pollutants. Uh, we've reduced that below zero. I mean, uh, we've reduced 99% of the lead that we had. Just looking at these, these numbers, carbon monoxide is down 77% since 1990. Lead's down 99%, nitro or nitrogen dioxide's 56%. And the list goes on. So if somebody says, you know, well, the air is so dirty now, it's the dirtiest air we've ever had. In the United States, that simply isn't true. Um, it's about at background levels now. We've gotten so sophisticated with a lot of this pollution control technology. Uh, the only thing that coal does have going for it is it emits twice the CO2 of natural gas. And that's why uh, the Obama administration sought to limit it. Um, so um, that is... Uh, when, when a lot of other people talk about clean coal, they talk about carbon sequestration and that sort of thing, but as, as other colleagues at the Heartland Institute pointed out, the climate models that were saying, oh, we're gonna expect this much 
global warming in response to increasing concentrations of CO2 have almost double or triple the amount of warming that they expected we would get compared to what we've actually observed with satellite balloon or satellite temperatures and weather balloon data. So the models have been incorrect at predicting temperatures and that's really important to consider. Um, so how much, how much coal is there? If it's a fossil fuel, I hear this a lot. Well, if we're going to run out eventually, why not start now with wind and solar and you know, get, a, get ahead of everybody else on that? And, and the reason is, these are the coal reserves in the United States. Alaska has a lot as well, but it's so remote up there that there's really no reason to mine up there when we have all this coal in the, United, the lower 48. But Wyoming is the largest producer of coal in the country. West Virginia is number two. You have the Illinois Basin, which is gigantic. Kentucky, um, Ohio, Pennsylvania. A lot, of, a lot of states that went for, for President Trump understood that he, you know, obviously was a, was a coal guy. Um, so we have 283 years worth of coal available to us right now. And that's great because coal is less vulnerable to supply shocks and price shocks than oil or natural gas just because it's, it's a global commodity, but it's not as widely used. South America uses almost no coal for their electricity generation. They're almost all oil and natural gas. So uh, America has a really good opportunity to have the lowest possible electricity prices that we can, but we need to use coal in order to realize that benefit. Um, and we had, we did have a war on coal. Uh, I know some people like to poo-poo that, but the, President Obama did have a lot of regulations on the coal industry that dramatically reduced the use of coal. And most of that was the Clean Power Plan. Um, and all these other ones were very important too, but I'm not gonna, not gonna get into that. Um, so what was the cost? What was the cost of reducing the amount of coal that we're using in our nation's electricity supply. Uh, this is just a chart that shows you the, the cost of electricity from each source. And existing coal-fired power plants can generate electricity for about 40 bucks per megawatt hour, which is pretty good. Uh, existing nuclear is a little cheaper. Existing gas is a little cheaper. But when you're looking at wind and solar, it's $107 and $140. So it's two and a half to three times cheaper to use coal than it is wind or solar. And people People scratch their heads a lot when that happens because they say, well, there's, there's no staffing, there's no, um, there's no fuel cost, how can it possibly be cheaper to use coal than it is wind? And the reason is wind stops blowing and you need to have some sort of um, other backup generation source to come in. It's like if you owned a store and you had one employee that worked for free but he didn't always show up, you would have to pay another employee in order to make sure that that work is getting done. So it actually costs more because you don't know if you have to pay that employee overtime. It's, it's a mess. So that's why, um, that's why, that's one of the reasons. But also transmission costs. This is, this is something that the Obama administration did not put in their levelized cost of energy, which was a big oversight because the transmission costs for hooking up wind and solar to the grid are enormous because wind and solar facilities are generally very far away from the population centers that need the electricity. You can build a coal fire power plant anywhere there's a railroad or anywhere there is a, um, a natural gas pipeline. So uh, Texas did this. They, they are the largest producer of electricity from wind in the country and most of that wind is up in the, the panhandle. So they had to build these huge transmission corridors in order to bring this wind to the population centers, Austin, Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio. And it cost over $7 billion to construct 3,600 3, miles of this transmission line, which is almost $2 million a mile, and that's $950 for every household in Texas. So you are imposing a massive cost, and at the end of the day, only one eighth of the electricity that's generated in Texas comes from wind. The rest is natural gas or coal. So you're incorporating all this uncertainty and extra cost onto the grid, and that's raising the prices for everyone else. Uh, and then this is, this is a look at California. California has aggressively gotten rid of coal from their electricity grid, and they've replaced it with solar and wind. And you see that their uh, industrial electricity prices are about 80% higher than the rest of the country. And that's, that's just going to keep happening uh, wherever they decide that they're going to replace natural gas fire power plants with battery storage. Uh, they're just adding more and more layers of cost into the system in order to try to stabilize it. When we had a perfectly stable grid before, you know, there was always some hiccups, but we had consistent coal fire power plants that were just churning out steady amounts of energy at a very affordable price. And this is 
Um, this is a chart of three electricity markets in the eastern United States. And PJM is a 13-state conglomerate. It's got Pennsylvania, Ohio, Kentucky, West Virginia, uh, a lot of other places. And uh, the ISO New England, that's you know, New England area, and New York is the NYISO. And you see that all of these energy prices track the natural gas prices pretty closely, but PJM is consistently below the cost of natural gas because whenever natural gas prices spike, they can switch to coal. So if we don't have that luxury going forward in the United States and natural gas prices go up, whether that's because we're exporting more or whether there's a spike in demand for home heating, then we are putting ourselves at a competitive disadvantage going forward. And I think having that freedom to be fuel flexible is incredibly important. Um, so when it comes to this, the Sierra Club is obviously the most outspoken when it comes to closing coal-fired power plants. They have a Beyond Coal campaign, and it's, it's very well funded. They just got $64 million from uh, Bloomberg in October of 2017. So they use sue and settle techniques, and their goal is to close every coal-fired power plant in the country. They have closed about 260, a little more than that, and their goal is to close the other 260 in the near future. And this is just, this is what it looks like. So all the red ones are existing coal-fired power plants that are still operating. Uh, because I got this from their site, they put the red scary number as the ones that are still operating, whereas I would reverse the colors on here. Um, but the, um, the closed down ones, those are the, are the, uh, the gray ones are the ones that have been closed down, and the, um, the orange ones are the ones that have had certain units retired. So you see some in Minnesota, they're closing down some of the units, but not all. The same in Wisconsin, Colorado. And uh, when we were talking about energy dominance, uh, President Trump doesn't want to be energy self-sufficient. He wants to be energy dominant. He wants to be able to tell Saudi Arabia, guess what, we produce more oil than you. We don't need to be as nice to you as we have been in the past. And one of the funniest things I thought about the whole Russia investigation was President like a would-be President Clinton's policies would have restricted the amount of oil and natural gas that we were producing in the United States. And Russia's a petro state. They need to sell as much oil and gas for the highest possible price. So I don't get it. I don't see a correlation between uh, uh, President Trump's policies as far as, you know, drill baby drill and helping out Vladimir Putin. I just don't see that. Um, so we can, we can meet all of our domestic energy needs and we can export, which helps out our friends and neighbors. Uh, Ukraine doesn't have to worry about Russia shutting off the pipeline anymore. It's, it's really changed the world and that's incredibly great because it's soft power that we don't need to flex our, our military might anymore. So in the end, coal's still important and don't let anyone tell you it isn't. <laughs> all right, thank you.